Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to those joining us today. Um, we are expecting a high number of attendees, so just while we wait for everybody to join us, catch up, settle in, I'll just take us nice and slowly through a little bit of housekeeping um, for everybody on the call already. So um, lines have been muted, um, cameras are off today just to minimize any technical disruptions and glitches, um, and hopefully you are all seeing you're hearing me okay and you're also seeing the presentation slide on screen so we'll be walking through that shortly um, you also have a control panel on your screen um, so hopefully somewhere on the right or left you can see ways of communicating with us if you're having any technical difficulties you can use a chat um, but also there's a box there for questions so during today's presentation at any point you can ask questions um, and we will have time towards the end to dedicate towards are getting through as many as those as possible. Um, so with that said, um, we have got uh, about 70 people already joining. We're expecting somewhere close to 100. It's a global audience today, so we've got people dialing in from Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, as well as North America. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of you are probably joining today's call because your organization is being impacted by changes in global market trends, often unexpected. So for example, if you're dialing in from Australia, you know that over the past six months, you've probably been looking at the Australia um, US dollar exchange rate fluctuating in a huge range of around 15 to 16%, sometimes as high as 0.71 on the exchange rate, sometimes as low as close to 0.61. So a lot of volatility happening. So you've probably, if you're on the call, been discussing um, the commercial implications of some of these types of trends, not just currency, inflation, energy, in your monthly finance meetings, for example. So if you have, know that you're not alone. Um, that's why we're here today. You know, 70% of companies that we've surveyed, like yours, say that they really need more guidance on global market and currency trends to really help currency planning and making decision-making a lot easier. So that's why today will be actually the first of Convera's Global Market Insights webinar series every single month in 2023. In terms of your speakers today, um, it's going to help provide that forward guidance on economic global trends, but also currency. Um, I'm Nuaz Ali. I'm on the left there. I'll be facilitating toward uh, today's call. I won't go through and read all of the names here. You can see them, but know that today we're going to provide you with a holistic global overview so that you can benefit from different perspectives from around the world. And that's useful because you know you may be a company based in Australia or joining from Singapore today, but you could have customers in the US or in Europe. So not only will you be able to think about how today's topics um, impact you and your business, but also how is this impacting your customers overseas, whether you're importing or exporting. Agenda, the agenda is pretty straightforward. You know, we'll start off with a global overview. I'll then hand you over to Stephen. Um, Stephen's going to look, um, firstly, a little bit more at global events, um, but then focus really on APAC. What's happening in terms of the currency and how could currency forecast scenarios play out over the next six months? We'll then hand over to Joe, who was on the, on the previous slide that you saw. Joe will look at things a lot more from a North American perspective and give you a little bit more insight in what's happening over in the US. We'll focus a lot more time during those sections on the currency forecasts and the currency forecast scenarios to help you visualize what kind of developments could play out over the next six months. What should you be considering when you're forward planning? So to start off with, I'll just set the scene a little bit and then I'll hand you over to Steve. Um, so we, before we get into the main part of the presentation, this key insights page should hopefully help underline some of the global challenges that are really hard to keep track of so if i take you to the top left if you look at the us call out box no expectations about us interest rates changed recently they've changed again they will change again in the future and this is one fact in factor causing ripples throughout the global economy and currency markets but there are other factors at play too so if, you know in europe we still have the russia russia situation while in the australia box in the bottom right hand corner you're seeing and you're all experiencing rapid rises in interest rates to deal with a decades high inflation. But you know this could also tip the economy into recession this year. And that's a similar situation to the UK 
in the box in the left hand corner. So hopefully this webinar today is going to help you go away more informed about market trends, upcoming events, uh, what do you need to know about FX volatility, and hopefully maybe help you think differently or ask yourself some different questions about your currency risk or how to make your cross-border payment strategy a little bit smarter this year. So with that introduction made, um, Steve, I'm going to hand you over um, to take you over, uh, hand you over, sorry, to Steve to summarize um, things from a global perspective, but also take you into the APAC session. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, Naz, and uh, great to be here and great to see so many people joining the call. Like you said, exciting to have this as the first of a series of uh, monthly webinars that we have coming up. Um, if we look at the um, next slide, and we're really looking at the three big themes um, in the global economy that the year has started off um, driving the economy and driving global markets. And firstly, the most interesting factor that we've seen at the start of this year and what's really driven a lot of the moves has been that economic data has been so strong. Now, we've seen some of the inflation data ease off. Um, in the US in particular, inflation's moved from above 9% to um, around 6.5% over the last six months or so. But other data has remained much stronger and really, not just in the US, but globally, what's really been driving this has been a strong labour market. And the numbers are quite incredible. Um, in the UK, unemployment at 3.7%. That's the lowest rate since 1974. In Australia, the, inflation, the unemployment rate has ticked up a little bit. It was at 3.4% um, in the middle of last year. Again, that was the lowest level since 1974. It's moved up to 37 and in the US, uh, unemployment at 3.4%. That's the lowest since May 1969. That's before man walked on the moon. So this is what's really driving the economic data to remain strong. And if you look at other measures, uh, business confidence, consumer confidence, business activity, they're drifting lower, but it's the strong labour market that's been really the driver of this better economic data. And that's really kept central banks around the world focused on the fact that a strong labour market means consumers keep spending. As consumers keep spending, that means they need to keep hiking interest rates. So that really remains the defining theme for the first part of this year. Economic data has been strong. And the reason why is because labour markets have remained much more resilient than we might have expected. This is really pushed forward about when interest rates might peak. And certainly we started the year thinking that maybe the Fed was very close to their final rate hike. But the strong labour market and better economic data has really seen that pushed past the first quarter and maybe into the second half of this year. Looking at um, pricing from the uh, US money market in terms of the federal funds rate, where official US interest rates might be. There are now four more interest rate hikes priced in, four more 25 basis point interest rate hikes priced in. But even so, we at some point this year, uh, we'll get to a level, more likely than not, when central banks around the world do pause. Um, the Bank of Canada have already said that they are now pausing their rate hiking cycle. The RBA this morning, the Reserve Bank of Australia, said they're very close to pausing. So we're getting closer and closer to that peak in interest rates. And historically, once we have reached that peak, equity markets tend to rebound. And currencies that are sensitive to global growth, like the Chinese yuan, like the Australian dollar, tend to rebound in those environments as well. Finally, the last big global theme we've seen so far in 2023 has been that uh, geopolitics has eased from the real peak of concern that we saw in the start to middle of 2022 when the Russian invasion of Ukraine saw geopolitical tensions at a record high. Um, while those tensions have eased, 
they certainly remain very key and they remain in the position where they can suddenly spark moves in global markets and FX markets specifically very easy to come back onto the radar. I've already seen this year with some tensions around um, potential spy balloons uh, in the US and across US allies. Um, we saw over the weekend at the National People's Congress in China, ongoing concerns about some of those export restrictions from the US, particularly around high technology. And it remains really clear that geopolitics can become a major impact on markets very quickly. And even if I say um, that geopolitics has eased somewhat as a major concern, you can still see at a very much heightened level compared to where we've been over the last three years, excluding that period during the first part of that Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, if we look into the next slide, what we're really looking at here is the fact that um, interest rates are a key driver of that uh, FX markets. And that's been pretty clear so far this year as well. US short-term bond yields measured by the two-year uh, bond yield in the US above 5% overnight. That's the first time since the middle of 2007 that we've seen US two-year bond yields above that level. So short-term bond yields like the two-year are a sign of Federal Reserve expectations. So heightened expectations for the Federal Reserve are, are, are more important in FX markets uh, than they have been uh, for some time. It's driving the US dollar higher, and that's why we've seen a big move uh, over February in the US dollar. The US dollar index up around about 5%. It's seen the uh, Aussie US fall to three month lows overnight, and it's seen the dollar CNY up near that key historical level around seven um, overnight as well. So, this is part of the reason why we're seeing volatility at the moment in markets, because in FX markets, they are very sensitive to interest rates. And as we see these big shifts in expectations from central banks, that's what tends to drive the real volatility. And you can see here this 100-day um, rolling correlation between FX uh, and rates is right up near the high. So when central bank moves become the single biggest focus for financial markets, then that's when you tend to see the big moves in FX and very highly correlated. So certainly in the near term over the next three to six months, this is likely to remain the remain in place because what really drives um, volatility in foreign exchange markets is shifts in central bank expectations. And when we see markets most sensitive to this, tend to either be at the start or at the end of a tightening cycle because financial markets, of course, they try to look in the future, try to extrapolate into the future and they do that according to the current circumstances. And you can see at the start of the year, where we thought, well, maybe the Fed's going to pause this quarter to now where we think maybe we're going to get four more rate hikes of 25 basis points from the Fed. That shift has driven the big volatility in foreign exchange markets that we've seen so far this year. And while that remains on the agenda, then we expect to see heightened levels of volatility in foreign exchange until we get some kind of answer about when the Fed will pause and when other central banks around the world will be also nearing a pause, nearing a peak in their tightening cycles. So, of course, it's going to be these big central bank meetings and the big events that drive central bank meetings that are going to drive that volatility. So, on the next slide, you can see our calendar where we're looking at what the big event in March is likely to be. And really, of course, there's always lots happening in FX markets, but there are two big clusters this month where we're focused on the potential for big moves in FX markets. And first of all, it's near the end of this week. On um, Wednesday night, we have the Bank of Canada decision. On Thursday, the 9th, we have the Bank of um, the, the the Bank of Japan decision, and then on the tenth, 
we have the uh, going into the 11th, uh, the US jobs report. So really key in terms of um, uh, of central banks and the impact on central bank policy making. The Bank of Canada are they going to remain on pause as the first central bank to really signal that they are going to halt their interest rate hikes. In the Bank of Japan, critical for the, um, the, the expectations for the yen, moving to a new regime with Governor Kuroda hosting his final meeting before the new Bank of Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda comes in from next month. And then of course the US jobs report, as we say, absolutely critical for those Fed expectations with that very strong labor market in the US causing the Fed to rethink and potentially raise rates further than had previously been anticipated. The other big cluster of data is between that 22, 23, 24th of March. You can see a whole lot of central bank decisions. Uh, the um, Bank of England uh, decision key there as well. But of course, most important, the US Federal Reserve um, on the 22nd in North America, on the 23rd here in APAC. And as we heard overnight from the Federal Reserve um, Chair, Jerome Powell, that um, there is the potential for a 50 basis point hike. He said that a 25 basis point hike, which they shifted down to recently, is not anchored in stone, a sign that we could get a 50 basis point hike there as well. So if we do, US dollar will typically rise strongly into that kind of event and after that kind of event, higher than expected interest rates tend to result in a stronger currency. So they're the two big phases this month we'll be looking at. The end of this week, 8th, 9th and 10th, and in two weeks time, the 22nd, 23rd and the 24th. So let's look at this next slide and you will really see that it's the Federal Reserve, of course, the most important uh, event as we've already mentioned. Um, and you can see how much those rate expectations have changed over the last couple of months. Um, a rate hike of 25 basis points in March has jumped from around 50% at the end of December to 75% or 76% to be precise um, most recently. A 25 basis point rate hike in May has jumped from around 30% a month ago up to 75%. And a 25 basis point hike in June has jumped from close to zero at the start of February to 60% now. So high rate, and rate expectations have become incredibly heightened. And the only reason that March rate hike has drifted a little bit lower is because more and more investors are betting on a 50 basis point rate hike. What we're looking at is the chances of a 25 basis point rate hike. So you can really see when the major volatility for the month ahead is going to occur, it's more likely than not, without some kind of unexpected event coming in from left field, going to be that Federal Reserve decision, as we said, on the 22nd in the US and on the 23rd here in APAC. So that's what's happening in the global economy and what we're focused on in the month ahead in terms of the global macroeconomic picture. But let's drill down now and have a closer look at the region and a closer look at some of the impacts on financial markets and FX markets in particular. And the next slide, I want to look at some of the volatility that we've seen so far this year. And What's most interesting is some of the big jumps in volatility we've seen. And we've already mentioned that what drives volatility in FX markets is uncertainty about central bank moves. And as we are more uncertain, we see more volatility. I think that's most illustrated by the Aussie US already this year. In the first two months of the year, has already moved in a 7% range year to date. Now, on average, the Aussie US since 1983 has moved in a 19% range. So I'll quickly get my calculator out here and think you know, 7 
uh, present over 19%. We've already done about 40% of the kind of move we expect to see in less than the first two months of the year. So that's why we're seeing a more volatile foreign exchange market so far because of these uncertainties from um, our central banks. And in Australia, for example, we started the year thinking that maybe the RBA was nearing a pause. Their February statement came out and said, we've got more to come. We've got two rate hikes um, this year. And then over the last 24 hours, the RBA said, well, maybe we're nearing a pause. That uncertainty around central banks driving a lot of volatility in the Aussie US. And of course, we um, topped out near 7150 at the start of the year and we've drifted back below 68 overnight uh, in what's been a very volatile start to the year. The other major volatility we've seen in um, the um, APAC region has been in the Kiwi US. More volatile in February, but less volatile year to date. And that's been because, again, the New Zealand dollar tends to be one of the most sensitive currencies to interest rate expectations, particularly at the moment where they have interest rates that are broadly the highest in the um, G10 or in the developed world, um, the highest interest rates in line with um, the US at 4.75 in New Zealand. So um, as a result, a lot of speculators will be buying New Zealand dollars to take advantage of that yield, uh, of those high interest rates, and that tends to drive more volatility in the Kiwi. So that's why the Aussie US and the New Zealand dollar US have been the most volatile currencies really in the APAC region that we've seen. The other market I want to highlight here is in the dollar CNY. And I know it's at the lower end of the range um, with a 3% uh, 30 day trading range and 3.5% year to date. But that doesn't show that historically the dollar CMY tends to be one of the less volatile markets. Of course, it's very closely controlled by the People's Bank of China. So we don't see the volatility in the dollar CMY that we see in a lot of other markets. So in actuality, that 3% range in the last 30 days, that 3.5% range in the year to date is actually pretty wild for the uh, dollar CMY. And again, that's been driven partly by this US dollar volatility, but also by the fact that we're really focused on this Chinese reopening story. And as we move on to the next couple of slides, um, that's going kind to of become more and more important because the Chinese economy appears to be bouncing back from its COVID restrictions last year a lot quicker than markets had thought, and those markets had had quite heightened expectations. So that's what's driving real volatility in the C and Y, and it might mean why the Chinese yuan can be stronger into 2023. Now, that's the volatility story uh, for APAC. I want to look now at the um, value. Which markets have been moving the most in comparison to their historical averages? And uh, this looking specifically at Australia, um, the green sections are currencies that are above their moving averages and the purple sections are currencies that are below their moving average. So looking at their historical average, which currencies are above those? which currencies are below there. And that's just a way of identifying value um, in terms of historical context. And you can see that really the highlight here is the Aussie yen um, up versus year to date, down one year average, but up versus the two year and up significantly versus the five year. And of course, that's been driven partly in the short term uh, by expectation that that new Bank of Japan Governor Kazu Aeda is likely to keep stimulus in place, at least in the short term, over the next three to six months. So that's helped the Aussie yen push higher. Um, another market I think that's interesting at the moment is the Aussie euro. You can see starting to drift back lower here. So that purple 
shows you that it is below those um, historical averages. And the European Central Bank um, now looking likely to have more interest rates to come, certainly relative to Australia. If you look at the forward curve for the European Central Bank, around about 150 basis points worth of interest rate hikes priced in, in Australia, it's less than 50. So clearly markets are betting on more rate hikes from Europe than from Australia, and that's causing the Aussie Euro to drift back lower, and it's fallen further since this table was produced. Right at the bottom, of course, the Aussie US, under its long-term averages on both the year to, well, on all of the year to date, one year, two year, and five year averages. So um, certainly, uh, Aussie really stuck in the doldrums. Um, a good rally that we saw from October to January, uh, but the Aussie US really pressured by those looming Federal Reserve rate hikes. Okay, before I wrap up, I'd like to look at our FX forecast scenarios um, for two of the major markets in the region, the Aussie US and the dollar CY. Let's start with the Aussie US. And what we're trying to really focus on here at Convera is to make sure that we look at the potential scenarios. I've already said how volatile FX markets have been so far in 2023. So I really believe that we do our customers a disservice if we say we think the Aussie dollar will be at 69 cents uh, at the end of the year. Now we do say that, but it only tells part of the story. We've already seen the Aussie dollar move from 71.50 to below 66 in the first two months of this year. So we need to accept the volatility in markets. So think about the scenarios that can drive that kind of volatility. There was a recent report from McKinsey about why scenario analysis is so important in, in business planning. And there's two reasons. First of all, is because we tend to believe as humans that the future is going to look just a little bit like the past. We just extrapolate from the past into the future. But in fact, that's not what happens. Things can change a lot. And we've already seen that so far this year. Most forecasters were looking for the Aussie dollar to drift higher for most of the first part of this year, in line with the drift higher we've seen over the last three months. That didn't happen. What happened is we drifted higher for a bit and then we sunk like a stone. So the future doesn't continue a bit like the past. We see big shifts. And we, when we see big shifts, they tend to occur a lot quicker than markets think. So that's why this scenario analysis is so powerful for business planning and for planning your foreign exchange risk management. So as I say, our core view is the Aussie dollar likely to drift up uh, in the first six months of this year and then broadly hold between 69 and 70. But what can drive those volatility and those scenarios? Well, first of all, what can drive us higher if the Chinese recovery comes in quicker than expected? If it drives much more positive optimism, pushes commodities higher, then that can drive the Aussie dollar higher as well. If the Federal Reserve starts to pause its rate hiking cycle, the US dollar might fall and the Aussie dollar can push higher. So that's what can drive a move higher to the top end of the range. What can drive the Aussie dollar to the bottom end of the range? Well, we've already seen that occurring right now. The Fed inflation fight continues. And um, for now, that's the scenario that's driving markets. Inflation remaining persistent and central banks led by the Federal Reserve continue to raise rates. Whether we stay at these levels will really depend on whether that story continues beyond June. But you can see what will drive this market. And the reality is, with the Aussie dollar's 19% average um, since 1983, that's the most likely outcome, is that we will spend some time in that purple zone near the lower end of the range. And we could spend some time in that green zone at the top end of the range. And if we do, we shouldn't be surprised. That will be a perfectly typical year for the Aussie US, which as we say, trades on average in a 19% range. Looking at the dollar CNY on the next page, and that clearly shows you as well a similar story 
um, that what's really going to drive these markets is the pace of Chinese economic recovery and what the Federal Reserve does next. And our base case is that the dollar CNY will drift back lower as the Chinese reopening boosts the Chinese yuan. That certainly seems the case. If you look at the most up-to-date reading of the Chinese economy, PMI numbers that came out last week, well above expectations. Um, new loan growth at an absolute record in a sign that typically shows you that the Chinese government has encouraged banks to lend and to drive economic growth. So that's certainly our base case. Expect the dollar CMY to continue to move back lower. Again, what could drive those scenarios to the top or the bottom end of the range? Well, if the US remains boosted by persistent inflation, we can see us move well above that seven and up to that sort of 720, 730 level that was really seen uh, in the latter part of 2023. So, um, as I say, we were only there three or four months ago. It's easy to get back to that level. But to the downside as well, um, if the Fed holds um, interest rates once they've got to their peak, if the Chinese economy recovers more quickly, then we can move back towards that 630, 620 level. And again, these are levels we were only at at the first part of 2022. So these ranges, they're not far-fetched. They're broadly in line with what we saw last year. And if we see volatility in line with what we saw last year, then again, the risk is that we can see a move up above 7 to 720, but we can see a move back towards 620, 630, with what's broadly the kind of volatility that we do Used to, we do now see in the dollar CY. So that's really the view from the macro perspective and, and in APAC more specifically. Um, I'm going to, uh, going to hand over now to um, Joe Nimbo from our US team, and he'll give us an update on the North American currency outlook. Joe. All right, Steve, thank you so much. Very thorough insight, really, in the APAC region and beyond, so uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, so my job now is to talk about the North America perspective. And on the next slide, you'll see here, while the US dollar's epic surge last year to 20 year peaks has dissipated a bit, this slide here shows uh, North, American, North America volatility analysis, and it really illustrates how the greenback retains, a sol it retains solid gains versus many but really not all of its major counterparts. Uh, here, I'm gonna highlight uh, Euro dollar and dollar yen. Those are uh, two popular currency pairs uh, for the region over here. And given that we're still in the early stages of the year, there isn't, uh, there isn't a major difference really between the 30-day range and the year-to-date range. Uh, for, for the volatility story, if you look at Euro dollar, uh, you can see that the high over the last 30 days has been 110 to 105. Uh, while year to date it shows a slightly wider range of uh, 110 to the top again, uh, but the bottom being a little bit lower, 104 as the low. So, despite the euro's jump uh, to 110 in early February, uh, that was the highest level in 10 months, uh, the euro is still confined uh, to the bottom of the range. And again, as you see, if you look at uh, euro dollar, it's uh, the bottom third of the, of, uh, the chart there. Uh, you can see that uh, the lower percentage position within the range, that shows that Euro dollar is, fav is favoring uh, the bottom of that range. And really that's what uh, strong US data has done and uh, market repricing of a higher peak in US interest rates, uh, that both of those factors have really strengthened the dollar. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more in just a bit on uh, how that story has continued to evolve. Uh, we heard from the Fed chairman today and uh, he really sounded hawkish and that had it, that's really sent a, a jolt through markets. If you look at the day on Wall Street, uh, stocks took it on the chin, uh, treasury yields rose, and the dollar exploded to multi-month highs. Uh, for the dollar index, we're now talking three-month highs for the dollar index above 105. Sterling got inside of 119, so uh, the pound is at three and a half month lows at, at the 118 level, and uh, dollar Canada, We've seen the dollar against its Canadian counterpart uh, climb up above uh, 137, 137.60. Uh, 
That's a four month high for the greenback against Canada. But uh, the other pair that I really wanna focus on here, uh, that's just a, a little bit of uh, uh, the impact that Fed Chair Powell's comments had on some of the major currency pairs. But if you look at dollar yen, uh, the second one down here from the top, you can see that's uh, really maintaining uh, the, the range for both 30 days, uh, the last 30 days, as well as year to date. Uh, the high being 135, actually we need to uh, change that because already uh, in the wake of the Fed Chairman's hawkish remarks, uh, we've seen uh, dollar yen rise to fresh highs for the year. You have to go back uh, for the Japanese yen. Yeah, these are mid-December lows for the Japanese yen against the greenback at, uh, at uh, 137.50 has been the top so far. So already uh, these ranges are a bit out of date because that really illustrates the volatility that we're seeing uh, because uh, the market has such a heightened focus on central banks. And if the market now has to pencil in more rate hikes by the Fed, well, this is having a, a meaningful impact on some of the major currency pairs. So like I said, here, we talk about 135 to, one, to 128 the past 30 days. It's actually uh, a, a bit higher given the dollar appreciation. And again, 135 to 127 year to date. But if you look to um, if you look over to the right side of this line, you can see how uh, the dollar has really outperformed. And these higher percentages, uh, more than 90% on both a 30-day as well as year-to-date, uh, that just goes to show that uh, the greenback does maintain the lion's share of its recent gains against its Japanese counterpart. So uh, what I do want to focus on is that in terms of uh, the Japanese yen, the yen really remains at a disadvantage, really in a world where major central banks outside of Japan have not only raised interest rates, but they've really done so aggressively to fight uh, decades high inflation. And that has really taken a toll on the Japanese currency just because uh, the BOJ has, has had this uh, hesitancy to follow in the footsteps of some of the other central banks that are tightening policy. Uh, so we'll get into more of that, but uh, that's just uh, the volatility uh, story right here. Now on the next slide, we're gonna talk about value. Uh, we can see that um, in terms of value, uh, the value story, uh, this pans out a bit. It gives us a high level view. Or if we talk about some of the long-term average uh, exchange rates, uh, dollar yen, as you can see here, uh, the year today average so far has been about 3%. Uh, even after today's uh, rally in the dollar, uh, it's, it's a bit higher. But still, uh, while over the past one year, the average rate is a uh, little change. But if you pair that, uh, if you show that, if you contrast that with what's going on uh, over uh, a two-year time span as well as five years, we're talking some 10 and 18% stronger um, for the U.S. dollar against its Japanese counterpart uh, over that time frame. So again, certainly that is a favorable market for yen buyers, but the key question here is how long is that going to be the case? Uh, we're going to have to circle back to that because uh, that's going to be an that's going to be a talk that one of the topics we'll be talking about in the in the coming slides. But um, but th that's going to be one of the key things to look out for. Now, in terms of uh, the euro, euro dollar, that's one of the other. That's the the major currency pair over here. We can see that uh, year to date, um, year to date, uh, the euro is about uh, a percent and a half weaker. Uh, compared to how it's averaged so far this year. But if you look out over a one-year period, it's uh, it's a bit of a mixed picture with the euro a little bit higher uh, than the one-year average uh, that we've seen, that being in the 104 region. Now, if you look at the, the level for the euro over a two and five-year time span, uh, that's where you can see some, um, some real dep depreciation in the euro, down about 4%, a little more than 4% over uh, two years ago. While compared to five years ago, we're seeing that uh, the euro is down more than 6% against its U.S. counterpart. And again, a lot of that has to do with central banks. Certainly, the road to where we are today has uh, depicted a more aggressive Fed compared to the ECB. But the road from here, say, to the end of the year, does suggest that maybe we could see more rate hikes from Europe uh, as opposed from uh, the U.S., and that could be a, a certainly a source of uh, strength for the euro. Maybe not uh, in the near term, but maybe over the second half of the year, when it seems like the Fed may be on track to start to pause interest rate hikes, uh, while at the same time it looks like uh, there's going to be more life, more longevity 
in terms of uh, upside for ECB uh, lending rates. So on the next slide, I want to talk, actually, if we could just stay right here, sorry, if we can go back for a second. One of the things I did want to touch on was uh, the Mexican peso. I did mention how the dollar has really outperformed a number of its uh, major counterparts, except one, and that has been its uh, southern counterpart, uh, the Mexican peso. Uh, the peso uh, really dominated last year. Uh, those gains have stretched into 2023, and that has to do with uh, the Bank of Mexico. Uh, certainly the Fed has uh, dominated the spotlight in terms of how aggressive the Fed has been in raising interest rates. The Fed has jacked up rates by four, and a half percentage points uh, over the past year. Mexico, you, if you go back to uh, mid 2021, we've seen uh, the Bank of Mexico raise rates by some 700 basis points. That's 14 consecutive meetings that Mexico has raised rates. And their key benchmark right now, their key benchmark rate is at 11%. That's a record high. So that does explain some of uh, uh, the peso's uh, outperformance against the otherwise uh, stronger greenback. Uh, the, upper, the, the, the more hawkish stand so far by Mexico to try and uh, rein in uh, high inflation uh, below the border there, below the U.S. border of that, that is. Now, on the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, future scenarios. And again, we find it more appropriate to focus on the scenario factors rather than, say, uh, interest rate forecasts, uh, which need to be updated often. But the central scenario or base case calls for the euro to grind higher. Uh, over the course of this year. And again, that's on the view that uh, we could see more rate hikes from uh, the ECB uh, going forward, say, uh, as opposed to how many more the Fed has. Uh, Steve did a great job of illustrating how uh, the Fed has another you know, four 25 basis point rate hikes. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the ECB might have to go as high as uh, 150 basis points um, and raise rates to around 4% from where they are now at uh, two and a half percent. So it's certainly not helping the euro now because uh, everything that the Fed is doing is overshadowing uh, the market. But again, we'll have to keep tabs on the ECB. We're gonna hear from the ECB uh, next week on the 16th of March. Uh, we're gonna hear from the ECB. Uh, the ECB has already signaled that they plan to raise rates by uh, 50 basis points. And we'll have to see if that is gonna be a pattern that continues. Uh, over the coming months. And again, if so, I think that would put the spotlight back on Europe, how Europe is still in the throes of just trying to get a hold of uh, inflation. It's coming down in Europe, but again, at, uh, at over 8%, it remains too high uh, and certainly four times uh, the ECB's uh, 2% goal. So uh, in talk about upside scenarios, what could push the Euro higher? Well, could we test 115? It certainly seems uh, certainly out of the market today, but if Europe's economy should fare better than expected, and if it can avoid a deep downturn, well, that would certainly be positive for the Euro. Uh, so that's one thing to look out for. On the other hand, uh, what could knock the Euro lower? Uh, that's been uh, the theme in recent weeks. We, uh, again, uh, about a month ago, we were talking about 10 month highs for the Euro against the greenback at this 110 level. Uh, now we're back in the 105s. And that has to do with the Fed. You know, does the Fed have to uh, step up rate increases? That was the message today from Fed Chairman Powell. He acknowledged that uh, the data has been coming in hot. It's been coming in stronger than expected. It's not just that. There's been uh, upward revisions to recent economic surveys. A and so the Fed, uh, the Fed Chair Powell, he sounded amenable to having to step up the pace of rate hikes going 50 basis points. And at last check, I was looking at uh, the futures markets. Uh, now, a 50 basis point rate hike uh, on the 22nd of this month by the Fed is now the base case, um, and that's quite a turnaround. So it's like a you know 70% likelihood of a half point rate hike by the Fed this month uh, compared to where it was yesterday. I think it was around 30% of uh, the, the Fed having to go by 50 basis points. So again, a few comments from the Fed chairman. He spoke today uh, to the Senate side of the aisle. Uh, to congressional lawmakers on Capitol Hill. He's going to do the same thing in terms of uh, testimony to the, uh, the to the House tomorrow. So again, Mr. Powell is likely to re reiterate this hawkish message, but we'll have to listen to the Q&A session. That's, that's uh, something that could be a bit different than what happened uh, today. So uh, expect more volatility. And what's going to really be important is with the market now betting on the Fed going bigger, 
this month. Uh, it's going to take some data to disappoint. If we get uh, the U.S. jobs report that comes out on Friday of this week uh, for the month of February, if that number disappoints, well, then I think the market would have a, another rethink. Is the Fed really going to go 50? Will it only go 25 in this case? Uh, and then again, what if uh, the, the jobs report knocks it out of the park again? Uh, I, that would certainly cement expectations for uh, the Fed to go big at its next meeting. And then next week, uh, we've got uh, fresh inflation numbers. So a lot of data to keep the debate high uh, as to where the Fed ultimately, uh, where the Fed's uh, key rate ultimately peaks. So that's gonna keep the story going. Now, uh, for the Japanese yen on the next slide, uh, this is my final slide here. So uh, the base case uh, for the Japanese yen does call for uh, the US dollar to surrender some of its gains over the course of this year. And that's on the view that the Fed may be edging closer to hitting the pause button on rate hikes, uh, while Japan is yet to start. We'll have to see what uh, Kuroda's uh, last meeting as uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan this week, uh, what that does and the handover uh, next month um, to the new uh, central bank governor. We'll have to see if uh, that change in leadership, does that hasten any, uh, any pivot to uh, higher interest rates? That's gonna be the key thing to look out for. So. If, uh, if you want to talk upside scenario for uh, dollar yen, certainly a yield sensitive currency pair. Again, if we have this ongoing hesitancy on the part of Japan uh, not to raise interest rates, uh, that's something that would tend to put upward pressure on uh, dollar yen and keep uh, levels maybe in the 140s in play. And again, low, low uh, interest rates in Japan, they really stand in stark contrast to what the Fed has done. Uh, it seems like US interest rates, uh, where could they peak now? Well, the market's talking uh, somewhere above maybe 5.6. And uh, by contrast, in, in Japan, interest rates are near zero. So that favorable interest rate dynamic, uh, that is certainly playing out in a positive way. And that continues to, at least for now, exert upward pressure on dollar yen. To the downside, could the dollar uh, give back some gains? Well, certainly, uh, if we were to see uh, the new Bank of Japan governor, if he were to abandon some of these low rate policies uh, sooner than the markets anticipate, well, that would certainly be yen positive. Maybe we could see uh, dollar yen uh, take a crack below 120. Uh, watch the inflation story in Japan. Uh, inflation is moving up. If it's sustained, well, that would, bode, that would also bode well for uh, the, uh, the, the Bank of Japan to pivot to uh, interest rate lift off sooner rather than later. So uh, those are some of the factors to look out for that could certainly be pivotal uh, for dollar yen as we go throughout the year. So now uh, it's my pleasure to turn it back over to uh, Naz and he's going to talk international strategy. Hey, thank you, Joe, and also Stephen um, for that great overview. So to everybody still on with us on the call, um, I'll only take about two minutes of your time here and then we move on to, to questions and answers. So we've got plenty of time still. Um, we're still we hope to get you off before the end of the hour. Um, but do we will try and spend a good five to ten minutes on questions. So if you haven't submitted anything so far, we've had a couple of questions come in. Please use your question box, submit your questions. We'll go on to those um, and then I'll also explain towards the end how to receive today's slide and the recording of today's call. So before then, I just wanted to share with you some practical next steps to consider. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of the type of conversations that we're currently having with over 30,000 customers globally across various different sectors and various different types of verticals. So if I can focus your attention on this slide to the far left-hand corner on currency volatility, and if you stay with me there for a second, if you think back to Joe and Steve's presentations, um, they talked a lot about 10 to 15% fluctuations in whether it's the Aussie US dollar or the Euro US dollar. And a lot of these movements happening in just the space of a few months. So if you take a look at some of the, if I just read the box, the green box to you um, directly, it's, you know, what if we continue to see material five to 10 percent shifts in your key exchange rates or your target rate stays uh, at levels significantly above or below your budgeted level? So these are some things to think about today and ask yourself some questions. You know, if we are going to see more five to 10 percent exchange rate shifts, who in your organization is responsible for tracking and reporting these shifts to the business, explaining whether they're positive or risks to the business, 
Um, and also what products or solutions do you use to do something about it? How is that translating into strategic decisions and tactical actions? So it's important to consider because you know research that we've done in the past, um, some of you on the call may be familiar with our uh, FX barometer report, which showed that some companies can face financial difficulties when they see negative exchange rate moves of just 5%, particularly when you think about the manufacturing sector and low margins. So if this is you, you're on the left-hand side or in that currency volatility box, please do speak to us after today's call or set up a meeting with your account manager to ask us, how can I do things differently? Or what are all other organizations in my industry doing to deal with the same problems that I have? There are other things at play around the world. You know, in the middle of this slide, you can see things like geopolitics, sanctions, they have consequences on import and export activity. So if any of you out there are looking at supply chains, how to make supply chains work more efficiently, or how to actually pick up and diversify supply chains. If any of you are doing that, you're also having to think about how do I also diversify the subsequent financial supply chain? Different currency, different region, different compliance checks, different methods of making or receiving payments potentially. So if you are looking to diversify financial supply chains, then again, let us know and we can help you with uh, some best practices in that area. Lastly, on the right-hand side, climate change. What's not on this slide is if you're a financial institution, a large university, you're making and receiving multiple mass payments in lots of different currencies every single month. Are you using the most efficient technology and payment methods to do this? How are you saving time and cost? So again, these are some of the conversations we would love to have with you. That's all I wanted to share in terms of some strategic considerations and conversations that you may want to think about going forward. Um, I'll just take a, we'll just slow right down here now, give you an opportunity to, to take in a lot of information that we've shared today, submit some questions that we'll be happy to answer. And like I said, we'll, uh, we'll share information on how to get the slides and recording um, before the end of the call and give you some time back at the end. Okay, so um, I'm just having a look across some of the questions that have come in. Um, so as a reminder, you should see your box um, to submit questions on your control panel. We have had one or two come in already. Um, this one I think is coming from somebody in Australia. Steve, I'll, I'll maybe point this one in your direction. Um, so the first question is, how does the shift in commentary from the Reserve Bank of Australia over the past 24 hours impact your uh, rate forecasts, your Aussie dollar, US dollar rate forecasts? Oh, thanks, Dad, and uh, thank you for the um, for that question. Look, I'll be frank, no one wants a big change in central bank commentary in the 24 hours before you present a webinar. Um, most of the slides have already been uh, produced and our forecasts are well and truly done and dusted, but uh, that's uh, one of the, uh, what you have to deal with in uh, foreign exchange. Um, look, uh, overall, it doesn't change our forecast. I think it goes down um, and shows why we are really focused on that scenario analysis because it takes into account um, you know, the volatility that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, just to, to update what, um, we, what we've seen over the last 24 hours is that um, two points from the RBA. First of all, the RBA yesterday at their statement, they raised rates by 25 basis points to 3.6%, but they said that they believe inflation might be peaked, might have peaked now, and that they might not need to go, um, they might not need to um, continue to raise rates um, in the very near term. So getting closer and closer um, to a pause, and they reasserted that this morning as well, the uh, Governor Philip Lowe, um, speaking to the Australian Financial Review Business Summit, uh, said that we're getting near to a point where we can pause. So it does seem like we're close to a pause in Australian interest rates. Like I said, it creates noise in the short term. That's why the Aussie dollar has fallen to three month lows this morning. But in the um, medium term, it doesn't change the big factors that drive our Aussie dollar forecast this year. One, that the Australian key interest rates will probably settle you know, somewhere between you know, 3.5 and 4%. And whether it's sort of um, you know, 
we get another one at 3.85, if we get two more to 4.1, um, we're still going to settle just below where the Federal Reserve might settle, which will probably be at 5% or just above. So it doesn't change that benchmark uh, interest rate differential between Australia and the US, which is a big driver of the Aussie dollar valuation. And also doesn't change the fact that a big reason that we think the Aussie dollar can drift higher from where we are now is part of the um, Chinese reopening story. That's really going to continue to play out and provide support to the Australian dollar. And then finally, um, the Federal Reserve, as we said, whether they pause, um, whether that US peak in interest rates occurs um, you know, um, in the next three months or the next six months, it's more than likely to occur at some point this year. And when it does, that typically helps equity markets higher and will help the Aussie dollar higher as well. So. Um, in the short term, it creates noise, and that's why we use this scenario analysis to, um, to, to embed that noise in our forecast. But over the medium term, it doesn't change the three big factors that drive our Aussie dollar forecast. Where will Aussie interest rates be compared to US interest rates? Just below the US. What will happen with China? It's going to continue to recover. And when the Fed does pause, that should be supportive for risk sentiment and supportive for the Aussie dollar as well. Thank you, Steve. Um, Cindy, we come on to your question in a second. Before we do, Joe, we've had one come in asking around rates. So question for you, Joe, I think, is how high could the US Federal Reserve raise US interest rates? The answer tends to uh, vary day to day almost. Yeah, that's a good question. That, that's one that the Fed is going to offer its best guess at its meeting later on this month, again, the 22nd, I guess uh, the 23rd for the APAC region. Uh, as we touched on, uh, hot data uh, does have the Fed on track to raise rates to, uh, it sounds like now north of 5.5% uh, from roughly 4.6% uh, at the moment. Back in December, the last time the Fed gave us uh, its best uh, estimates as to where the economy and interest rates were headed, uh, the Fed uh, back in December thought uh, rates would top out somewhere between 5.1 and 5.4 percent. So yeah, it looks like a little bit a bit more upside uh, for U.S. interest rates. And uh, the key thing to look out for is going to be inflation. Uh, the Fed chairman is really concerned about inflation. He said uh, today that, uh, again, inflation has a long way to go to, to get back down to the Fed's 2 percent target. And it, the, the road back down to 2 percent is likely to be uh, very bumpy. So if inflation continues to cool, but it's doing so only slowly, then you can't rule out a terminal rate, uh, a so-called uh, peak rate, uh, closer to 6%. Uh, that would not be out of the question, 6%. So again, it's going to hinge on the data, but um, as the story evolves, it continues to be more hawkish and uh, the market continues to revise up its expectations for U.S. interest rates. So the feeling is now the Fed has about another 100 basis points to go. Thanks, Joe. Um, we're going to take, we're going to respect time. We'll take one more question here um, and then I'll wrap up with some important closing remarks for everybody on the call. Um, Steve, over to you. This question's come in. While the US increased the interest rates, Australia has also put through 10 rate rises in the past one and a half years. However, Aussie dollar has gotten weaker against the US dollar? Is it because US dollar is the dominant currency in the FX market? That's a good question and certainly that is part of um, the factor driving the um, FX markets. As Joe mentioned earlier about why there's a bit more focus on the, um, the US dollar strengthening versus the euro, even though there might be more rate hikes forecasted into the euro, Partly it is because the US dollar dominates FX markets and also acts as a safe haven. So when equity markets fall due to the fear of rising interest rates, um, investors will buy the US dollar as a safe haven. So it is partly the fact that the US dollar is a dominant, uh, is the dominant um, currency. And you often see that, that that dominance will assert itself in outperformance during times of concerns. Like you say, the um, RBA has hiked rates 10 times, but it's only brought official rates in Australia to 3.6%. 
Uh, the Federal Reserve has also hiked rates on a number of occasions over the last 12 months, and currently their interest rates are at 4.75. Um, so as a result, um, interest rates in the US are above the Australian dollar um, uh, interest rates as well. So that's also played into it as well. It's not just the, the frequency of, of rate hikes, uh, the Federal Reserve has also raised rates and their official interest rates are above as well. So typically a good rule of thumb is that if a currency has higher interest rates than another currency, it can very often outperform. So that's part of the factor as well, in addition to the fact that um, the US dollar does have this dominant position in foreign exchange markets. Thank you, Steve. So, um, and thank you everybody for your questions. If you just allow me one more minute for some closing remarks and we'll let you, we'll let you get off. We've had um, well over 130 people on the call today. Um, when you exit today's call, please do take a minute to, to give us your feedback in a one minute exit survey. Um, the recording is gonna be sent to you automatically um, via email and it's gonna come from currencycombo at convera.com. Um, so look out for that email and that email address. Um, and if you still require the slides in PowerPoint or PDF format, you can always reach out to your account manager or use the contact details on this slide here to let us know and we'll speak to you and get you what you need. Thank you to everybody for joining. We hope this webinar will help you go away a little bit more informed about the economic trends, the upcoming events, and, and mainly how this is going or could impact FX volatility and how you may want to reconsider um, the way you're thinking about um, your currency risk or your cross-border payment strategy. Um, and maybe even using some of the slides that you've seen today in your next finance meeting, like the forecast scenarios uh, to help you do that. As a reminder, this call today is the first of a monthly series. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. With that, wishing you all good luck. Thank you. <laughs>